are humans who live in patterns, like our lives are patterns until we realize we're in the pattern and get to choose if we want to stay in the pattern or not, right? And the habituation can come at the expense of a life well lived and not stepping into our fullest expression and our potential and really feeling into what our heart was meant to do. And it can mean like boredom and apathy and stress and, and burnout. That's what happened to me. And when we start to design our own life, we get to create a life that we're excited about, right? It's, you know, how intentional are you about creating your life? Welcome to the 1000 Days Sober podcast. I am, of course, Lee Davey. I am not an alcoholic. I refuse to be anonymous. I am someone that doesn't drink alcohol. I am an incredible father, husband, leader, lover, and I spend every minute of every day coaching people and guiding people and inspiring people to live self-led lives without alcohol. How are you doing, folks? I am currently in Wales, Wales, Wales. I have uh, found a lovely little house through Trusted House Sitters. I am uh, in Grangetown. I'm looking after two beautiful cats, one called Loki and one called Lucifer. I'm here until the end of April. And this is the first time I've done a podcast from this beautiful, beautiful home. So thanks for Gemini for... Uh, Trusting me to look after your little children in your home. Really appreciate it. And I love the vibe here. It's a great energy. So I'm feeling really upbeat right now. Um, what is going on in my life? Well, I'm still just waiting it out. I'm still uh, trying to get that visa. Uh, it's going to take the rest of 2022. My family is still in California. I did have a wonderful weekend with my son, Jude. I surprised him. It was his 21st birthday party. Um... It was a beautiful moment for me because I was a little bit nervous. I hadn't spoken to his mom for three years and hadn't spoken to his, my other side of the family. Um, you know, because you, when you go through a divorce, you 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 don't just lose your, your wife or your husband. You lose an entire family structure sometimes. You know, I, I, I love my in-laws and my aunties and my uncles and my cousins and all that. And, and I was really nervous going to see them on Saturday. And... Um, they all treated me with so much love and so much respect and so much warmth. So it was a really beautiful night. And normally I sneak out of these things around nine o'clock when everyone gets really drunk. But there was a beautiful vibe to the place. Everybody was smashed. I was the only person not drinking. But there wasn't that usual animosity or um, anger that was there. Maybe it's my neuroception. Maybe... As I am spending more and more time in self-energy, um, maybe I'm not projecting uh, this angst into the world. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. It's the only time I've been out, you know, in a setting where everyone's been drinking probably for three years. So maybe I'm reading too much into it. But I had a really great time. I had a really great time. Um, anyway, on to our guest. So Andrea Tessier. Sounds a nice name, doesn't it? Tessier. Uh, she's a personal freedom coach and an Elementum certified master life coach who is committed to supporting women to access more authenticity, self-expression, and freedom in their lives. She left a successful teaching career at 39 to pursue a life she truly felt passionate about. And this didn't come easy for her. It took a journey of looking inward, self-discovery, and remembering or re-remembering and unlearning to allow herself to create the life of her dreams. Andrea now supports women in answering the big questions on their journey, like, who am I? What do I really desire? And what am I meant to do? And how do I get there in a way that feels true to me? She is passionate about helping others move from stuck and stressed to intentional and free with a vast toolbox that encompasses the body, mind, and spirit. If you want to reach out to Andrea, Andrea, after you've listened to her speak, then you can find her at www.andreatessier.com. That's Andrea, T-E-S-S-I-E-R. You can find her on Instagram, tessier.andrea, and also at Facebook, 
Andrea Tessier Coaching. If you can't remember all of that, email me, thestrivemethod at gmail.com, and I'll put you in touch with her, all right? I myself have had coaching with her, personal one-on-one coaching. She's amazing. She's amazing. Really makes you feel safe, and she's got vast experience. Um, of course, yeah, she's trained by the same coaches who trained me, so um, she is top-notch, all right? So today, we're going to talk about the difference between um, a, lo- a default life and a life of design. Uh, so I hope you enjoy it. Much love, everybody. Take care and strive on. Andrea, <laughs> <laughs> welcome to the World of Lee Davy podcasting where you have no time to prepare. There's no <laughs> questions. You just dropped right in the shit straight off the bat. How are you yes. doing? Throw you into the deep end. No big deal. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I've already done a little bit of an introduction, but, um, you know, expand on it a little bit. Tell people what you're all about. Eek. Hi. Okay. So I'm Andrea Tessier. I am a certified Elementum Master Coach and a personal freedom coach. And this new path sort of came to me because I was in a place where I was insecure and lived the the hustle and the sacrifice life that looked right on paper. And I was 38 when I burnt out from teaching and I could do all of the right things. You know, I could get the shit done. I could push through, I could figure it out. I could quote unquote, get it right. And it was when I burnt out that I didn't have any other choice, but look inward and that's when I started to realize that I didn't have to wait for all of those outside circumstances to be just so that I could feel that success and and freedom now and without all of the efforting. And Mm. what I needed to do was really let go of everybody else's expectations and do the deep work to unlearn so I could remember who I am. And the only thing I really had to do is figure out how to like set myself free. And I can say that now and it sounds simple, but it's like really hard because (laughs) we have to unlearn and we have to have the willingness to look at the shit that we want to unlearn, you know, the coping and the beliefs and the behaviors that got us to where we were. And for a long time, I thought I could just flip the switch and it wasn't just as easy as flipping a switch. It was, it was a deep dive and a repatterning. Um, but ultimately, on the other side of it, I realized that like nothing about my external circumstances needed to change for this to, to take place. Like, I'm still single. I don't have an extra dollar in my bank account. I don't have any like giant travel plans that I thought would make me feel that freedom. But I do. Like, I feel more free than ever. And it's from that place that I truly get to serve from a place where my cup is full and now i got to support women in doing the same Mm, that's really beautiful and we're going to talk about design and default today or default and design life by default or life by design Mm -hmm. and it's really interesting that you um you know you have that teaching background because i have a brother-in-law and a sister-in-law who are both teachers right and we were talking the other day about how there was a part of them that was like, I, I wish there was something else I could do to make me more money to be able to get out of this kind of like this hole and to make me feel more secure about the future, you know, because, you know, teaching can has a limit on it unless you're going to get promoted to like, I don't know, like I I guess the promotions in teaching are very slim pickings. Right. So you kind of like if you financially you're constrained. So we were talking about it. Of course I'm, I'm coming into this as a 19 year, 19 year railway man. So I, I was in the railway for 19 years from leaving school. And then, you know, obviously when you do that, you're, your life for me anyway, was by default. So what I mean by that is I I didn't really go into that railway life thinking, oh, I'm going to be a railwayman for the rest of my life. And this is going to be my design. I'm going to be CEO. It just happened by default. 
but I was able to change it, right? And I could see my brother-in-law, my sister-in-law, and there was a part of me that was like, wow, okay, they're in a really tough spot, but how much is it by design and how much is it by default? And what would happen if they could really see a life of pure design? Because they both said, yeah, well, we love teaching. We wouldn't want to do anything else. But teaching is such a broad, expansive thing. Mm. Could we design it in a different way, right? So I, I just want to start out with that, you know, because you was a te- you was a teacher, you might still be teaching, uh, you know, on a, on a side gear castle. I don't know. Um, what are your thoughts around mm-hmm. default and design? And we can use a teacher or a railwayman as an yeah. example. Yeah, let's talk about default default and what we mean by design. And then I can share with you like my experience as an educator. And I supported teachers for the last several years while they were like in it and supported Mm. them through a burnout. So I can certainly share that experience as well. Um, But when I talk about default, I'm talking about like that automatic conditioning that we just like get programmed into by being humans in society at this time. Um, It's also getting on the hamster wheel without thinking about it every single morning. It's living in our survival patterns. It's living in the shoulds and the supposed tos. And, you know, it's the staying in the job we don't love because it's familiar Um, Mm -hmm. it's the getting the pension and getting the health insurance and it's getting the low mortgage rate because that's what we're supposed to do. It's the, the rules around being selfless. It's the not rocking the boat, but, um, by saying what's, by not saying what's really on our mind, it's, you know, not saying the thing because it might make somebody uncomfortable. Like that's the default mode and the supposed to's are the things that make us give our power to something outside of ourselves, like somebody else's ideal before our own inner wisdom. Mm. And there's no judgment there because like I said, I lived most of my life in that mode. And a lot of us do until we like decide to wake up. And I was doing what I thought was expected of me. Of me. And we all do, but it comes at sometimes the expense of me like my Mm. higher S self. Mm. And it was my burnout from teaching that was the thing that made me realize that that's what I had been doing for for that long. And the risk is, you know, the self-abandonment. It's the risk is ignoring our bodies. It's ignoring what we actually need, want, and desire because we think we're doing the right thing. Mm. And, and it is, it can be a comfortable life. It can be living a life where we know what to expect next, um, because it's safe and it's comfortable and because we don't have a plan of what else. And I see teachers run up with that, you know, thinking they need to know the exact next step before they take the scary leap because it's fucking scary. Like it really really is. So it makes sense. Like it makes so much sense that we do this. Like it makes sense that we choose the comfort of what we know over the risk of what we don't. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think I'm so glad you talked about fear then, because I think it, you know, you, you said a couple of things there that, um, that got me thinking. One was, you know, we stay in the job because of the pension. I mean, like I was the same, like on the railway, like one of the shames was when you leave after 19 years, your pension gets locked in for 19 years. You cannot continue to um, keep adding into it. And if I would have stayed on the railway, I'm 48 now, in seven years, I would have retired with a, and I wouldn't have had to worry about money, right? <laughs> which, which is not where I'm at right now. Um, so, you know, you said about staying in the job with a pension, all the security and all that. And then you also said something around um, not speaking our truth because almost like people pleasing, right? Not speaking our truth because we don't want to rock the boat with other people. But then I kept saying in my head, actually, there's a flip side to that, right? We stay in the job because we're afraid of leaving it. Mm-hmm. And we don't want to rock the boat, not because we don't want to upset Andrea. I'm afraid 
to rock the boat because I feel uncomfortable and afraid to rock it. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. And it's, it's fear, right. That Mm. keeps us exactly where we are. And, and listen, like if that's your life and you get so much joy out of your pension and you value taking care of your family and that fills you up, like amazing. You are choosing that. And all the power to you, there can be a sense of empowerment in there. Hmm. What I'm speaking about, the default is really like when you accept it as just this is how it is. Or you don't, or you, I guess you don't because even, you don't, you don't know what you don't know, right? So yeah. is this, yeah. it, it, you know, when I think of default, I think of my own personal default. And again, you said something so interesting that I want to touch upon, but my my original thinking of this when I left the railway was the matrix, right? So I stopped drinking, I left the railway, and then I was like, holy shit, that life that I had left, the railway, drinking, my marriage, uh, my friendships, where I lived, it wasn't my real life. Like it wasn't the life that I was supposed to live because it just happened by a string of cultural pressures and sometimes lack of options, right? Like, you know, where I live culturally, I didn't choose what school I went to go to. I didn't, I wasn't able to go to higher education because of my results. and, and And I got my railway job by accident, by actually trying to run away from the careers officer, but he grabbed me and taught me into applying for this job, which I got. And 19 years later, I was my, my definition of who I am. Right. So I was like, okay, I've left the matrix. Everything is like, like I can touch and is tangible is not real and I can change it. But something you said is like mind blowing is, None of that matters even. So like I thought it did, but you're saying, no, it don't matter. It's it's inside of you. Like you just said, like none of those matrix style things have changed in your life, but you yourself from within are choosing design over default. Expand upon that a little bit more. Yeah. Yeah. Because I, I think, yeah, let's talk about design because I think the problem with this habituation and again, like, we are humans who live in patterns. Like our lives are patterns until we realize we're in the pattern and get to choose if we want to stay in the pattern or not, right? And the habituation can come at the expense of a life well lived and not stepping into our fullest expression and our potential and really feeling into what our heart was meant to do. And it can mean like boredom and apathy and stress and and burnout. That's what happened to me. And when we start to design our own life, we got to create a life that we're excited about, right? It's, you know, how intentional are you about creating your life? Um, It's about becoming so self-aware, like self-awareness is my first pillar to personal freedom. Um, it's being aware of your yourself, your patterns, your beliefs, so they don't run your life. Um, and it's about taking full badass responsibility about your own shit mm. and accepting all of it. And it's accepting your thoughts and needs and desires and and life and expressing it in a way that feels meaningful to you. And then some amount of learning how to surrender and trust your own innate wisdom and guidance system. Um, And I think that's what it means, like owning who you are and witnessing and acknowledging and accepting all the parts of ourselves that we can actually relax. We, Mm -hmm. We can breathe a sigh of relief. We can undo the top button of our jeans and just be like, oh, fuck. Yes, this was available this whole time. <laughs> and like that's that where metaphor. I get to feel more, more connected. Um, and that's what I, I mean by living a life by design is mm. we get to just feel more alignment. And, mm. and- Let's touch upon the fear again, though, because yeah. I, I, I imagine there's a lot of our audience here who... 
who are terrified of self-awareness because alcohol has allowed them to numb that aspect of themselves. So they actually drink alcohol because they don't want to be self-aware. Because if you're self-aware, then you're you're aware of your pain and you're aware of your suffering. You're aware of your life of that has been designed from default. And it, it could be quite depressing and make you feel kind of like nihilistic. And it's like, you know, it's like, imagine if you'd like, <laughs> you develop self-awareness and you wake up one morning and you look across and the guy you've shared a bed with for 30 years, you suddenly realize that you don't love him. Right. Like, so if you're working with somebody who is really so trapped by their fear that they can't really get into that self-awareness groove. How would you approach that? Yeah. And I think that's, that's one of the things that keeps people stuck from doing the work and keeps people doing those, those numbing habits, like, like drinking, like you said, and that was me for a long time as well. So I have so much compassion to that. And that's been what's held people back from doing the work with me, like scared to look. Cause like what mm. happens when I look and every single one of them was like, Oh, I'm so glad that I looked because mm. of the relief that came after mm. because you're holding a lot. Like we are holding and holding and holding a lot. Like it's a lot of effort to push all that stuff under the rug and just hope you don't trip on it. What do you mean by that? When you say you're holding a lot for mm -hmm. someone listening, what do you mean? It's a, it's a lot of pressure, isn't it? To, to keep going in that way and to avoid the things that we're avoiding and to hold all the emotions and to hold all the, the pressure that we put on ourselves and that we allow society to put on ourselves. Like it's a lot and it's fucking heavy. Mm. And, and I guess a lot of people won't know it because they don't know it. Yeah. So, so, so they feel shit. Yeah. They don't know why they feel perpetually shit, but you just explained it. It's because they're holding on to this life of this default lifestyle externally and internally, which they don't want, which isn't really them. Um, and they, they cannot, they cannot like break. It's like this, it's like this big, huge, heavy ball yeah. and they can't drop it. Yeah. 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 It's exhausting. Mm. It is so fucking exhausting to hold on to that for so long. And which is why, which is why we burn out. Our nervous systems aren't meant to, to hold it. And so, you know, you're not wrong if that's the strategy that you're using, right? You're not wrong. And looking's not going to kill you. Mm. Every single woman who I've supported is like, oh, you actually can feel better. Like it is a little bit scary going into it. There is going to be resistance. And I mean, what we resist persists, right? And what we what we look at has a chance of, of releasing and releasing us, really. And, of, and we get to meet those scary parts and the shame and the fear with so much compassion. And if we're going into it thinking I'm going to judge all of these parts that I, I see in myself, then of course it's terrifying. But mm. if we go into it with an open heart and being like, listen, I'm going to love everything that I see that comes up. Yes, easier said than done. And this is why we get to do this work with support. But if we go into it with the intention of like, I'm going to be so fucking compassionate with whatever shows up here. Um, it doesn't feel as hard or as heavy in the long run. How, how do we, how do we build that compassion? I can imagine, um, I'm thinking about, I'm thinking of some of my clients now, actually, who, who are, you know, doing the work and not drinking and who are reaching out to me via Marco Polo WhatsApp and saying, I can't, I can't fucking believe that I have done this for so long. I cannot believe that I made these choices. I cannot believe that I am like my mother. I cannot believe I'm like my father. You know, how do we help them to be okay with that? How do we help them to be compassionate 
with themselves because we can be we can be compassionate with them. We can tell them to be compassionate. But if someone's listening to this, they don't have a coach. How can they be compassionate with themselves? Yeah, I acknowledge, I acknowledge, you know, your listeners and people going through that because it is hard. You see these things and you see where you went wrong. And you know, my perspective is that we do the best that we can until we know better. Hmm. And I can't believe it is to me, that sounds like a warrior. To me, that sounds like somebody who fought the good fight and did the best that they could and then had the courage to be able to choose. Like, how fucking cool is that, that they see it and they choose something different? Mm, mm. Right? It's not that they let it go for so long. It's like that they are choosing in this moment something different. Mm. So let's not focus on, you know, what you did for so long. Let's focus on how fucking badass it is. You're choosing something different now because that is cool. Mm. That is empowering to be able to choose something consciously. And I think that's really beautiful. I like that. So in a way you can pick something in the whole mosaic of the journey like hey look at what you're doing right now to help build those stores of confidence and courage and hope uh it's, it's almost like um it's almost like a like lego bricks right it's like we're we're putting one lego brick on another and we're just being like okay it took 48 years to get in this space it's going to take a little bit of time to get out of it um talk about survival patterns um mm. you, you mentioned you mentioned it earlier on and of course you know this is what we're talking about really is when we're when we're stuck in this life of default very often we are in a survival pattern we're at the edge of our window of tolerance our our sympathetic nervous system is like just ready it's on ready to be released all the time we don't even know it uh, but people might not be aware of that terminology survival pattern yeah and so this speaks me when i say survival pattern i think about like the personality patterns dr stephen kessler's work hmm. and you know the the patterns and i i believe you had him on did you have him on your podcast yeah he was he was my last guest actually yeah yeah um and so he his work is about the personality patterns which he also you know correlates it with survival patterns and mm. survival patterns can be anything from like my personal, like rigidness is a survival pattern. When I hold on, like start like white knuckling life, <laughs> and, like mm -hmm. controlling everything. Like, what do you mean Lee? You're not sending me questions for the podcast before. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah. That's, that's my uh, rigid pattern popping up. And I got to like soothe her survival patterns are also our codependency and our survival patterns are when we dissociate or when we go, you know, into the mind that that's the leaving pattern, our survival patterns are when we, you know, can be aggressive. Um, I had a client show up really aggressively because we had touched on some really sensitive parts of her the other day. And I was like, oh, she's, she's in pattern right now. Mm -hmm. And our patterns are our default mode. It's, it's where we go. It's what's most accessible when, when we're hurt, when we're in pain, when we're feeling sensitive and, and they're normal and they're natural because they're patterned until we choose something different. So the way, just to add to that, so when I think about survival patterns, it's Strive at the moment, I'm really pushing this, um, like there's lots of different ways out there to stop drinking alcohol, right? You can go to AA, you could do this naked mind, Holly Whitaker at Temper, everybody's trying to help you stop drinking. Uh, but to me, I realize that actually when you stop drinking, the work begins because when you stop drinking, stopping drinking is actually your way out of the matrix. It is your way, your opportunity to get out of default and into design because it's such a major, major shift away from like drinking alcohol is a major part of most of humanity's design. De defaults like most people drink and most people drink a lot and most people herald it as being a very 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 important influential part of their life so when you get rid of that it's it's holy shit 
I can change this part of my life. What else can I change? And that opens a door uh, to design, right? But I became, I actually stopped drinking, I don't know, maybe 13 years ago. And me and you met during the Elementum coaching training in 2021. I, I would say that was the moment where I started to understand my survival patterns. So, so get that if you're listening. I went 13 years thinking I had fucking figured shit out because I'd stopped drinking. And I hadn't even realized that I was still deeply, deeply stuck in default because even though I changed everything outside of myself, my wife, my children, my job, my environment, my career, my sense of meaning and purpose, I hadn't changed me. Yeah. 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 I hear you. And it's, it's not like a single moment, right? For me, it wasn't a single moment of like, Oh, now I'm living by design. No. It's a gradual melting and softening and a conscious decision to look at our experiences in life and choose to see them in a different light. I was, I had an experience last a couple of weeks ago where I learned something about myself, where I was like totally in a pattern and I had been asking for signs from the universe and, you know, doing all of the things. And I, I was kind of trying to manifest some, some new opportunities in my work. And then I started getting all these like pings of intuition from about an ex-boyfriend of mine. Mm -hmm. And I was getting little memories that were weird and thoughts popping into my head. And I brushed them off and brushed them off because doing the scary thing would be like, sending him a text message and I'm not going to freaking do that. And then I saw his name on a bright orange truck. Like I was walking down the street and the car was, the truck was parked on the wrong side of the road. Like this is like the biggest sign that you can get. And his name was right there in big orange writing. And I was like, that's weird. I'm not going to reach out. I need a signier sign universe. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> because my default was like to, to hide and to injure and to play it safe. Yeah. And I was like, I see that you're pushing me to reach out here, but I'm not going to do that. That's the scary thing. And thankfully I had like really awakened friends that were like, Andrea, what are you doing? Mm-hmm. You're like asking for signs. The universe is giving you signs and still you're not doing the thing that's scary. And I was like, that's what I do. That is what I do. I freaking play it safe. And I Mm. caught myself in a pattern because somebody lovingly held up a mirror to say, did you know you're doing this thing? And I was like, oh, crap. (laughs) So I could see that part of me. And I was like, okay, well, that's really interesting. I'm in a pattern. Clearly, a part of me feels really scared to reach out. I soothed that part of me. And I was like, yeah, it's a really scary thing to do. And we're going to do it anyway, because we don't want to be in that pattern anymore. (laughs) Yes, I like it. It's like, yeah, it's like learning to learning to find the humility. And this this is a real big one for me. Learning to find the humility that you don't know anything. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like every time you think you've got it. Like, I think what really helps me understand my survival patterns and understand and distinguish and discern between what I know about, you know, my default and my design, because there's so much I don't know is, is just at the very outset, accepting that I'm a complete fuck up. Right. Like, like I'm like actually accepting that I'm imperfectly perfect, which means there's no such thing as perfection, which means that the human condition is flawed. And, and that has so much power in it for me because it enables me to share anything um, unabashedly because that's who I am, that's what I want to do, and that's what I want to be, right? Yeah. Can I share? I'll share something now, actually. Yeah. My microphone going funny. I know my microphone is going funny. So when we talk about pans, mm. so I'm, I'm on a mission to help people who don't drink alcohol anymore 
to live a self-led life. So for those of you listening, self is, you know, that part of you that is by, it's a default, but it's a beautiful core default. It's the, it's the blueprint of who you were when the sperm met the egg and that zygote were formed, the blueprint of your perfect version of you, that is yourself. And then opposite that, you have your fractured ego, which is then created as a result of your fear of the world and trying to fit into everybody's ideals and culture and everything, which then becomes your, your ego, egoic default, I guess. Um, so I'm trying to help people to understand the difference between patterns, like we say in our survival patterns, um, the parts of us who, so if we think that we're all split personalities, the parts of us that are in pattern versus when we are in self. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to really raise the bar of awareness with my clients to always ask themselves, am I above or below the line here right now? Like, am I, am I above the line in a state of pure presence, in state of self? Or am I below the line in victim consciousness and being part led? Um, and I'll give you, and that's, this is what Strive is all about right now. It's not about stopping drinking alcohol. It's about that. It's about living a self-led life. And I'll give you an example about last night from last night. So I'm in Cardiff and I'm looking after a stranger's two cats, Loki and Lucifer. And um, last night I was looking after them for the first time. And it's the first time I've looked after animals for a long, 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 long time. And they they were very anxious and it was three o'clock in the morning and they're anxious and they're crying one of them is running around everywhere and i suddenly felt a deep compulsion to get out of bed go to the cat that was the most skittish pick it up and bring it into bed with me and cuddle it and i did and it, it, it stopped its meowing and crying. I felt that this cat was really, really anxious and, and scared and missing its mom. Couple that to an experience I had a couple of weeks ago where a friend of mine was feeling uncomfortable because their dog was barking at me in, in the house. And because the dog wouldn't shut up, this person hit the dog, mm. right? That, to me, in one instance with the hitting of the dog is a clear indication of a survival pattern. Like that, in that moment, a part of that human being emerged and felt really uncomfortable about how I would feel about their dog barking at me and their compensatory strategy was to hit the dog yeah. to make it be quiet because they felt uncomfortable that I would judge them, right? And then the flip side of that is last night is a clear sense of self because I've, I've had a cat in the past when I, like 10, 13 years ago, where I would have shut the door or I would have picked the cat up and I would have kicked it out because I because a part of me would have been activated, not myself. Yeah. You know, so for me, like the journey is, it's not even it's not even being in those different states it's knowing yeah it's having that awareness of oh that's not me or 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 that's a part of me yeah. that needs my attention right now yeah i think that's beautiful lee just those two different pictures that are so you know, the black and the white and how we learn through contrast. I think that's, that's a great um, example of both. And also I just want to acknowledge your mission and and that's the same as mine as a personal freedom mm. coach. I think that's when we truly get to create a, the life that we, we desire that we want to live is when we are in self is when we get to, we get to serve from that place and, what I heard in your cat story was just the compassion and clarity that you had from that space of like, that cat is in trouble and this is exactly how I'm going to help them without questioning it. And mm -hmm. 
And that's beautiful where we don't have that um, sovereignty over choice when we're dysregulated, when we are in our default pattern, like, like your friend. So, yeah. And most people will be in pattern and not know they're in pattern. So when I was going through the elements and coaching Institute, when I was going through my training, so many times the master coaches would be, Lee, get out of your head. And I'd be yeah. like, I'm not in my head. What do you want about I'm in my head? And, and I would get really angry. Well, of course, it was a, a part of me that didn't like to be told that I was, quote, unquote, doing something wrong. Now, obviously, they're not telling me that. But this part of me was like, no, you need to be perfect. People, you need to be right yes. um, uh, all the time. And that's what it's all about. And, and the, the learning to be wrong, to, to, to actually say, how, how can I be wrong here all the time? Like how, just to flip it so, so much, like, so like yin and yang, but switch it straight over and say, how could this person be completely right right now? really allows you cannot look at that question from a, from a survival plan i don't think no. no and there is no right or wrong right is that's just another general part that wants to to figure it out <laughs> yeah 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 and so i i think that awareness is the first piece is you know seeing that you're in a pattern whether it's choosing to drink alcohol or not choosing just doing it by default or you know going into the aggressive space or for me, like hunkering down and not doing the scary thing and, and having that awareness and awareness is actually harder to cultivate than we might think. Oh yeah. Right? How, how often do we just sit in silence with ourselves and like, just be the witness almost never. Right. We'll grab for something or we'll, you know, start planning something like being in silence with ourselves is how we get to cultivate that awareness mm. and, and noticing the judgment that comes up and noticing the protective patterns that come up and, and noticing that. And the, the piggyback to that awareness is accepting all of it, not making yourself wrong for it that all of it is, is there for a reason. And so those are the first two pillars of like coming into self, like you said, capital S self and, and ultimately finding your personal freedom when you're there. And then, and then being able to express all of that, to express what your imperfections and to <laughs> express your life in a way that feels authentic to you. And you know, the first fourth pillar is some amount of surrender and trust and knowing that you don't have to do it all on your own, that you have a really powerful inner guidance system. And that's what came through in your story about getting the cat. Like you knew in your being how to serve and support that cat in that moment. And when we get out of our own way, like that is available to us, that intuition, that awareness is available to us when, when we're tapped in and then mm. we just trust it. Right. You could have laid in bed and being like, I'm not going to get that cat. That cat is filthy. Like you could have laid in bed, like arguing with yourself, but you just trusted. Yeah. They do literally do. There was no argument. And I want to explain what went on there because I want to, I want to show people that if they're the same kind of like personality type stroke pattern as me, that you really have to introduce, you have to, I have to systematize my, my life to bring out myself. I'll explain now. Right. So before I, everybody, I mean, a lot of people have heard of like Julie Cameron's morning pages, right? where you wake up in the morning. So Julia Cameron wrote this book called The Artist's Way, and you wake up in the morning, and the first thing you do is you write three pages of stream of consciousness, you know, like just get this shit out on paper and start your day. And, and, I, and I like to say to people I work with who are trying to live a self-led life and trying to stop drinking alcohol, let's bookend our day, right? So I like, I like the morning pages, but I also like the evening pages. And one of the things I do when I go to bed for the evening pages, page one is like, what are my wins? What are my wins today, right? Like, 
I want to celebrate. I want to get into the art of celebration. I want to remind myself that I'm fucking amazing. Then every day, even if it might be a slow day, I incrementally inched forward a bit, right? So that's like my wins. The second page then is what am I worried about? Okay, now this is really important, right? For my system, my, t- my, my rigid pattern, right? So I lie there in bed and I say, what am I worried about? And I'll be like, I'm, I'm worried about how I'm going to take care of cats or I'm worried about um, this neighborhood because I don't really know it. I'm worried about when I'm going to see my wife and my my daughter next because I'm in a different country. So, but I'll take it one at a time, right? So I'd be like, okay, I'm worried that I'm not going to see my my family. And then I'll just close my eyes and I'll just be like, okay, who's worried here, mm-hmm. right? Who's worried? And and I very often I use non-dominant handwriting. So I'll write down on my, on my journal, who's worried with my right hand because I'm right-handed. And then I'll switch the pen to my left handed and then I'll write, I'm worried. And I'll have a conversation with myself. Mm. And very often it's a, uh, it's a, a part of me that, that is afraid. So like, um, there's a part of me that's afraid of the dark. Mm. Um, so when it says it's afraid of the dark, I get into a conversation with it and I see it and I make it okay that it's afraid of the dark. Mm-hmm. And then I ask it to trust me. And my parts are very trusting of self lately. Mm-hmm. And it's almost like I'm putting my parts to bed, like I'm tucking them in. And then when the cats cry, I've already dealt with my part. My parts are already tucked in bed and they're, they're trusting self. So when the cats cry, I'm not triggered. In addition to that, I'm hyper aware that I am alone. So I'm not with my wife and I'm not with my daughter and, you know, the two most triggering people on the planet to me and my wife and my daughter. Right. So I'm aware that I'm not in that environment, which allows I'm so I'm less triggered. I'm less part led and more self led. And that is swinging into momentum. Now, when I join with my wife and my daughter again, I'm hoping that momentum will allow me to treat my wife and my daughter like I treat those cats it will be a challenge. But so for me, that system, I system, systemizing my life of having that practice helps. The other one is setting an alarm every two hours. Mm -hmm. How do I feel right now? Mm -hmm. Am I, am I part led or am I self led? Like, like right now I'm feeling very self led. Mm -hmm. I don't know about you, but I'm feeling very self led. Right. You know, so and, and so if my alarm went off now, I'd be like, yeah, I'm feeling in the zone. I'm feeling like I'm I'm with it, you know. Do do you have any any ways or our tips or advice for people to raise that awareness of yeah, where they are? I love that. Thank you for sharing that. I think it's important for people to know how that you can practically bring it into your day and, and bookending mm. your day in a powerful way is is huge. Um, so the alarm is big, right? And, and that's what I, almost every single one of my clients, um, gets to do as one of their first assignments or stretches is setting them an alarm five, six times a day and scanning through their being. Like, how am I feeling? Am I mm. holding tension in my body right now? How is my energy? Like, and then what do I need right now? And is it some amount of comfort? Is it a glass of water? Like, it's never going to be something huge that you can't resource for yourself. It's not, I need a trip to Hawaii. It's going to be like, oh, I'm actually starting to feel a bit hungry. You need to take a break and get a snack. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And doing that, you know, every few hours, like you said, is a powerful way to check in and see that we are in control and we are safe and And even to acknowledge that we approve of ourselves in that moment is a powerful practice. And I I do the same. Um, Another practice I do is I do all of that 
self-care stuff in the morning. So that's Mm -hmm. when I'm doing my big check-in with myself. I'm checking in with my inner child. I do the same practice as you do. I I like tuck them into bed when I go to bed. Like, and they're like, my bed is full when I go to bed, just of younger versions of me. And everyone's tucked in. And when my inner child is getting their, their needs met, which are always just to be seen. And to know that they matter when they get to be tucked into bed in that way, I get to spend, spend a few moments with them and acknowledging them. Um, I think another powerful practice for, you know, self-awareness and self-acceptance is a journaling practice. Like you Mm -hmm. mentioned, you know, getting, you know, doing, um, a brain dump at the end of the day with like everything that's been on our mind or heart, Because that's where we truly get to meet ourselves. And by making those words like concrete, we get to know that we matter and that our thoughts, beliefs, you know, they matter because we do. And I think a journal is a really positive way to do that as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love that. Thank you for that. And very, very often, you know, it's like when it, when people, people will be like, I want to stop drinking alcohol. I'm now triggered. What do I do? Mm. And we, you know, we, we work at strive of creating trigger toolkits, right? Like if we're hypo aroused and we are feeling really low and lethargic, then we need some up regulators. And if we're feeling hyper aroused, we need some down regulators, but there's also the really important um, component of just being in whatever funk it is. Right. So very often, you know, I say to my clients, right, you want to drink right now, right? And they're like, yeah. And it's like, well, what what emotion is trying to come up? Well, I don't, I don't know. I don't want to know. Okay. Well, well, let's 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 invite it on. Let's let's bring it on. Maybe we just need to cry. Maybe we need to scream. Maybe we need to laugh hysterically. Maybe we just need to be in silence and feel actually what emotion feels like and feeling and sensation feels like in the body. How does it morph? How does it change? Yeah. You don't need a drink. You just need to just be. And I guess, I guess this is what people call surf in the earth, right? I just call it like, just sit with it. Don't pick your phone up. Don't go do this, that, and the other to keep yourself busy. Just notice what's going on. And, and, and that's, that's the freedom you're talking about, right? That is, that's the design, like feeling shit is freedom. Yeah. Yeah, it is. I worked with a client yesterday who is in despair and that's not a feeling that we want to stay in for very long because it's hard and it's heavy and it can be so consuming. Um, But what we do with those big feelings is try to fix them. Like, how do I fix this? Oh, I'm going to meditate. I'm going to fix this by going for a walk. I'm going to fix this by reminding myself that I get to be grateful. And what I coached her through is actually just sitting with the despair. Mm. And as uncomfortable as that was, she could comfort herself in that moment. Like she would her own babies, Mm. you know, hold on to that, that part of her that was in despair and sit through it and allow the emotions to come through. And it sounds simple, but it's so powerful to sit with all of the versions of ourselves in complete acceptance. Mm, mm, I love that. And I, and I, I just wanted to end the last 10 minutes on, you know, (laughs) men and men and women's patterns. So Mm. one of the things that, gets me into trouble is when is codependency. So when Liza is in pattern, I then feel very, very, very uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And my go-to is when I'm my go-to when I'm activating pattern is, is to do whatever I can to shift her out of pattern, not because I want her to feel good, Mm -hmm. but because I don't want to feel bad. Mm -hmm. And I see that in a lot of my male clients, right? 
So I think like for men listening to this, it, you know, it's like when, when you see that your partner is really struggling, mm. um, how should they show up? What should they do? I know it's a very broad question, but yeah, yeah, best with yeah. it. Yeah, when women, I mean, I can speak speak to mine, and I can speak of my experience of supporting other women. When we're in that dysregulated state and in pattern, we're not in our feminine embodied state. Our nervous system is dysregulated. We're quite often in our heads, not in our bodies. Um, over time, it looks like overstressed, overwhelmed, anxious, hypervigilant, um, can lead to burnout. And so what we need, we need the man to hold the strong, stable container to, to be the safe place so that that will then co-regulate as well. And so if we can be in that emotion without that affecting you, then it'll just calm down, right? So if you can remain regulated and be aware as you are and do your work and like take some deep belly breaths and be able to notice her pattern without going into pattern yourself and be that strong, stable container. I think that's the best thing that, that anybody can do to support another who's, who's in it. Mm, I love that. Melanie Joy, she wrote uh, Get In Relationships Right. And she's been a guest here on the show a couple of times. And she says that the core of all relationships is trust and security. So, you know, what I've learned is the women in a relationship really need to feel secure. Like that security and safety is like so important, right? Less so for the man. Like it's just modern times. Women are going to feel uh, unsafe more than men are, right? You know, um, and there's nothing like uh, pouring petrol on the fire of safety is when a, when Liza is feeling unsafe mm-hmm. and for whatever reason. And then she brings that to me and I do not create that safe container to allow her to just be in whatever state she is. And then if I try fixing, if I come with that masculine energy and masculine hits masculine, she doesn't feel safe. And then over time, that's how your relationships break up, right? Because it's like the woman is like, I'm not going to bring this to him. I can't trust him to hold this space for me, right? Like, yeah, I cannot trust him. So I'm not going to take it to him. And that leads to disconnection. So do you know what goes on in my mind? is so funny. I actually... I actually go into pan quite regularly. So I'll feel, I'll feel someone in the air's off. I'll, I'll, I'll go into that window of tolerance. I'll start to like, I feel my pan and then I'll talk to myself. I'll be like, Lee, this is what happens in my, do not fucking fix her. Do not fucking <laughs> fix her. Do not fix her. So she, she's talking to me and, and she thinks I'm holding space for a lot of times. And in my head is this voice going, do not fix her. Do not fix her. Uh, and I did that for the longest time. And then Liza would be like, thank you so much for holding space for me. And that, that's that right there. That encouragement is yeah. so important to a man. That's beautiful because you created a gap. Right. And, and from what I understand is like women, like you said, are wired for, for going into fear and men are wired for going into shame. And it happens back, right. If, if something's wrong with my partner, I, something, I did something wrong. I need to fix it to, to support that shame. And what I'm hearing you say is you've created a gap where you're like, okay, I'm not going to go into pattern. I'm just going to sit here. <laughs> and, and well, I'm you- actually, I'm actually in pattern. I'm actually in pattern, but in a way it's help. It's helping the situation because what it's doing is it's, I'm actually using pattern to change my typical way of dealing with it and I'm actually getting a result. So then I'm getting a feedback loop that's saying, Oh, if you don't fix her, then, then she likes it. 
which then allows me to not go in the pattern. I'm not, I'm so yeah, because you're, wacky. Choosing, you're choosing. You're like, I see this. I see that it's here. I see that it's up for me. This is so freaking uncomfortable. And I'm going to sit here and hold it and not do anything. So you are actually choosing yeah. in that moment and you've taken the power back. And over time, it could be that it feels less triggering because you're, you've started to create yes. a gap. Yeah. And you, you, see, you, you get forward. that gap. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's not automatic. It's not like we don't go into pattern and then we're cured. It's like, oh, we see the pattern and we choose and we hold and continue to choose something different. And I think that's what's beautiful about that story that you just shared is you are choosing something different in that moment every single time. That's and when, when you, when you develop, when you're able to, let's say you're doing this work on your own. This happens a lot, right? You're doing this work on your own, but you start to actually make a real difference. You know, your wife or your husband would just say, I don't know what's going on, but I feel closer to you. Or you've really changed lately, or there's a different energy or aura around you, right? It opens up a conversation. Like It's like, oh, yeah, okay, well, this is what I've been doing. And so that allows you then to make that bridge. And if you need to, you don't always have to. It only takes one to change your relationship, I believe. But there's something really powerful about being able to let, <laughs> let down your partner and then literally within 30 seconds of letting them down to say, hey, Lies, I was so triggered right then. A part of me was super activated. I'm so sorry. Can we start again? Right. Mm. Or, hey, I just got super activated. I can't be here for you right now. Are you okay if I just take care of myself? Because I feel that this is really important for you and I want to make sure that I'm in self. And because she then recognizes and understands that language, because you're now opening up a conversation about it. Wow. The, the, the opportunities are just limitless, in my opinion. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Thank you. So, Andrea, how can people get to work with you? What you got going on? Are you got any courses? You just do one on one coaching? What's going on? Yeah, I love it. Um, yes. So, people can connect definitely through Instagram. The handle is just at tessier.andrea. So, it's my name in reverse. Um, they can email me at andrea at andreatessier.com. And I do a one on one coaching container. Um, that's where we get to dive deep and explore the thoughts, patterns, behaviors we've been living by and start to step into a more authentic and expressed and free version of ourselves. And so it's a six month long coaching container where we meet via zoom. I'm giving stretches and assignments in between, and it's such a joy to support women in that way, um, and see women win. And so that's what I'm doing right now. I've got some like little intuitive pings about a course that will come out in spring, um, but that's not not quite ready yet. Um, but the best way to get in touch is um, so to see if there's an availability for one-on-one -on -one coaching and see if we're a good fit. Awesome. And um, yeah, you could also email me at thestrivemethod.gmail.com and I'll put you in touch, Andrea. I've been fortunate enough to personally be coached by this wonderful lady. She's amazing. She's brilliant. She makes you feel really safe mm -hmm. and she's super talented and experienced. So if every one of us should have a coach, folks. So if you are, um, if you've got anything out of this, at all today, reach out to Andrea and hire her. It will be the best thing that you've done. Uh, keep up the good work. Keep um, making uh, incredible ladies um, find their design. Um, I really, I really love what you're doing. And thanks for being on. Really appreciate it. You are so welcome. Thank you for having me.